Well, I'm an experimental psychologist at heart, and which is a young subject. And, you know, it started at the end of the 19th century. And cognitive psychology is even later. That started in the middle of the 20th century and replaced behaviorism as the main um, way of studying people. And it, the cognitive in cognitive psychology essentially refers to the fact that we're using computers as a metaphor or information processing. So we talk about memory and storage. We talk about perception and um, templates. And social cognition arrived even later in a, at around you know, the end of the 20th century. Um, and initially, as the name implies, it was about applying the ideas of cognitive psychology to social psychology. And in the early days, this meant things like, how do we recognize emotions in people's faces. And that has two components because we could be talking about people's fleeting moods. Are they angry? Are they sad? Are they disgusted? Or it could be talking about people's dispositions, like is this person trustworthy? Um, is this a nice person? And that of course leads into things like prejudices, race prejudices, dehumanizing people, and all that sort of thing. Um, another aspect of social cognition at that time, which became very interesting to everybody, was the discovery of something called biological motion, which was invented, or I should say was discovered by Johansson in Sweden, where he did this very clever experiment where he took people, he attached lights to their joints, so they would have a, a light on your wrist, on your elbow, on your shoulder, and then you can film people where all you see is the lights, you don't see the people. And just from this very minimal information, you can see whether the person is walking or running, whether they're male or female, whether they're happy or sad. And this became a technique for experimentally studying one aspect of social perception, if you like. The key difference between cognitive psychology and behaviorism was that cognitive psychologists wanted to know what was happening in the mind and were not just looking at behavior. So they were concerned with what people were thinking, what they were introspecting, and, for example, how they solved problems, how they thought about problems in order to solve them. So cognitive psychologists were very interested in memory, attention, and perception. And, for example, you can show that how well you can perceive something depends on whether you're attending to it or whether it comes out of the blue. You can ask what is it that people attend to when they're confronted with a complicated scene. And one of the things that has, was shown by the, in, in social cognition is that the first thing we attend to is faces. If there's a face in the picture, that's what we look at first. And indeed, I'm reminded that there was a famous Russian psychologist called Yarbus who studied eye movements very early on in this field, and he showed how people actually look at faces in paintings and so on. So that was one, that was the way that social cognition developed. There are various questions that we study in social cognition which are still not really answered. So one question is, is there, are there, is social cognition something special? Is, are the ways that we interact with other people different from the ways that we interact with physical objects in the world? Are the ways that we attend to people different from the way we attend to um, trees or animals or something like that? Yes, yeah, so there's been a great deal of work in social cognition on 
the recognition of emotions in faces. And in the early days, this depended on basically taking photographs of actors representing emotions. And it turned out that there are roughly five different emotions that everybody can recognise across cultures, which I probably can't remember all of them, but it's happiness, sadness, disgust, surprise, and one other. <laughs> and there are always problems with this, because, for example, we recognise happiness by the, a smile, and it turned out in this research that there are actually two kinds of smile. There's a genuine smile, and there's something which is known as the Duchesne smile, which refers to the particular muscles involved, which is a sort of fake smile. And so people were very worried about using actors as our basic material for presenting emotions, because in a sense, unless they're extremely good actors, they may be producing the fake version. Now, more recently, a chap called Alex Todorov at Princeton um, in the last 20 years or so has managed to produce computerized versions of faces. So you don't need an actor, you actually have what they call a face space in which you can present different faces and you have dimensions. The way the faces are generated is, is based on the real muscles in the face. So you're actually um, simulating the expressions that can be produced by human faces. And one interesting feature or one f important aspect of a face is how trustworthy it is. And what you can show here is that you can easily generate faces that look trustworthy and faces that look untrustworthy. Everybody will agree that this face looks trustworthy and this face looks untrustworthy, but this almost certainly has nothing to do with reality. That is to say, someone with a face like this is not necessarily actually trustworthy. It's just that we have this social consensus about what a trustworthy face is. And um, interestingly, you can speculate, and this is something that is not yet fully confirmed, that if you, if you have the advantage to be born with a trustworthy face, you can take advantage of this. Well, I think social cognition is, is, is very important because it directly concerns our everyday lives and not just our everyday lives, but I mean, social life in general, social cognition is not relevant simply to, you know, how I talk to you at this moment and how I'm responding to your um, micro expressions as I talk to you, but also at a much larger scale, how do groups interact? How do societies work? And something that's obviously particularly concerning me at this moment, why on earth did the UK vote to leave the European Union? We social cognition will enable us to understand how some of these mechanisms actually work. <laughs>